Hello, readers. Coming up, it's episode number 207 with Bill Hayes on sweat. First, I wanted to encourage you to check out our website at booksonpod.com. While there, you can sort through past shows by episode number, book title, author's last name, or sort by category. For instance, select the health and fitness, history, or science and medicine category for episode number 94 with Daniel E. Lieberman on Exercised. This is Dan Lieberman. I'm author of Exercised, Why Something We Never Evolved to Do is Healthy and Rewarding. And you're listening to Books on Pod with Trey Elling. And I've totally enjoyed this great conversation. Hello, readers. Bill Hayes is the award-winning author of Insomniac City and How New York Breaks Your Heart. His newest book is titled Sweat, A History of Exercise. Bill, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Nice to be with you. Pleasure's all mine. So what was your goal with this book? My book, Sweat, History of Exercise, um, looks at the history of exercise over the millennia from ancient Greece and Rome uh, up to the present day, including the pandemic. So I go through the centuries from um, antiquity, the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, which I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, the 19th century, and up to about the mid 20th century. I was really interested in learning about exercise, learning about things I did not know. So it's not dealing so much with trends and fads of the last couple of decades, um, but really the, um, the whole past. And started really with the question, does exercise have a history? Um, a lot of people think it's just a 20th century or 20th and 21st century phenomenon. But as I discovered, that's not the case at all. So when did the word exercise come to be and what did it initially mean? Well, it really came to be articulated in the 5th century BC. Uh, we credit Hippocrates, now known as the father of medicine, as the first to really articulate the importance of exercise in one's health. And after he used the word exercise, he wrote two treatises on regimens for healthful living, which included advice about diet, exercise. Um, one could say that exercise really began as training for war, for military, for hand-to-hand -hand combat, going back to maybe the 10th century BC, um, and then evolved into training for athletic competition with the founding of the Olympic Games in the 8th century BC. Um, so exercise, fitness training had been around for different reasons, but it's really around the 5th century with Hippocrates and then followed up by Plato and other philosophers and physicians where it became something one incorporated into daily life. And to many people's surprise, there were actually gymnasiums, gyms, in almost every town in the ancient Greece, em Greek empire and ancient Roman empire. Um, and they were quite elaborate places. What did they look like? I, I have seen actually blueprints of what they looked like. Um, wrestling was very popular. So wrestling was sort of the central uh, space for exercise. I should say that the gymnasiums were open to men and boys alone. Women were not allowed and women were not encouraged or really permitted to exercise. Um, but there were spaces for uh, wrestling, for boxing, for a very um, kind of violent martial arts called pancration. It's kind of like mixed martial arts, I guess. Um, but at the same time, around the gymnasiums, there were porticos simply for walking. Walking was considered a reasonable form of exercise um, and running. Um, one important difference between gyms then and now is that men and boys exercised in the nude, just as they did in the Olympic Games. And in fact, the word gymnastics means exercising in the nude. So that is quite a difference. There weren't gym workout clothes back in ancient Greece. Now you tested this theory out by going <laughs> for a 
quick jog in the nude on some property that you and your partner owned. I believe it was in upstate New York. How did that go for you? That did, you know, Trey, I had to uh, had to test that idea because it's <laughs> something we just accept. You know, I think most people know that the Olympic Games of antiquity, uh, the athletes performed in the nude. You go to museums like the Met or museums in Texas and you see ancient Greek vases and amphorae and they're depicted in the nude. And we sort of just accept it as, oh, that's what they did. But I wondered, what is that like? <laughs> and how does one do that? And what does it feel like? So yes, uh, one day I thought to put it to the test and I did it in my own quasi scientific way. My partner had some land in the country. It was very private, no one around with about a quarter mile long driveway. So first I did a run in my regular running clothes and then I just stripped down. Uh, I did keep my my running shoes on, <laughs> despite the fact that some people think you can even run barefoot. And uh, I ran up and down the driveway, and I found that nature automatically provides its own jockstrap, <laughs> a kind of physical uh, equivalent to a jockstrap. Everything just gets sort of vacuum packed and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it made me understand um, how you could do a Olympic running race or a sprint or a marathon in the nude without too much trouble. Yeah, too much drama. How's down that? There. How's that? How's that for a description? Which would, trying um, to be discreet here. <laughs> oh no, it's incredible, and it reads so well in the book too. I only have one example like that in my life where yeah, it was a few years back at a wedding in Mexico. So of course it was alcohol fueled at the end of, of the course. reception where you had these employees of the resort trying to keep people out of the ocean and everybody just decided to do the, uh, the, the skinny dip thing and rip, sure. rip our suits or our casual, whatever clothes for the, uh, for the beach wedding, uh, down, <laughs> down to nothing and run to the ocean. And it was exhilarating all the way until you hit that slightly frigid water and the, uh, constriction <laughs> that was already occurring naturally only intensified from there. Absolutely. Well, um, I mean, we all know about skinny dipping and how good that feels. So I had to see if running naked felt good too. And it did, you know, everything just contracted. Uh, the balls contracted, <laughs> dick contracted, and um, it worked out just fine. So I, the wish word I wish I'd had a lake or an ocean to jump into at the end. I remember, I remember it was a blazing hot day. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine how good that would feel. Uh, so the word athlete comes from the Greek as well. It was first recorded in book eight of the Odyssey and ancient athletes were so revered that mm -hmm. their sweat possessed immense value. How yeah. was it gathered and sold? And then what was yeah. it used for thereafter? Yeah, this was something I discovered early on. You know, my book is one I've worked on for about 10 years. And this was an early fact I discovered. And it just captivated my imagination. Um, yes, the sweat of athletes was considered very precious and um, they believed it contained almost medicinal properties. The actual essence of the athletes, the um, excellence or what they called erite was exuded in the sweat and oil that was, um, that they perspired when they, when they, um, ran or when they were in competition. So they created a special tool called a strigil. And it was kind of a long, shaped like a celery stalk. And you can see these in museums. Um, you know, they've dug them up in excavations. And they would scrape the sweat off their bodies. And then it had a kind of tapered at the end. And then they poured into a little pot. And again, these pots were like made of clay. And then I'm sure it smelled Ugh. awful. Yeah. Let's just say funky. <laughs> um, but, you know, the better the athlete, the more of a champion, the more valuable this sweat was to sell. It had a name. It was called Gloios, G-L-O-I-O-S. And it was sold at gyms. And one might think that Gloios was used by doctors or personal fitness trainers, because there were personal fitness trainers back, back in antiquity to make people better athletes or exercise better. 
but instead it was used for such uncomfortable maladies as hemorrhoids and genital warts and dermatological problems. So um, yeah, I don't recommend it. Um, but it was actually done for a long time. And uh, you can find proof at uh, museums like the Met in New York and, and other places. But yeah, when I learned about Gloyos, I just thought, I really do have to call this book Sweat. Yeah. I think it was the perfect title. And that, that is yeah. horrifying to think about. But then again, if you lived in those times, it was standard. So I guess it's uh, yeah. easier to justify in the moment. So much of this book is has to do with your pursuit of the 1500s book called De Arte Gymnastica, written right. by an Italian doctor by the name of uh, Girolamo Mercuriale and illustrated by a true Renaissance man, Piero Ligorio, who we'll get into a little bit later on. Why were you right. so intrigued by this book, Bill? Um, this was someone completely unknown to me. You know, I've written three earlier books that deal a little bit with the um, history of medicine and history of science. And so when I had this idea to write a book on the history of exercise, which partly just came out of my own personal experience, I've always loved to work out. I've been a runner, a swimmer, so forth. I started at the library, you know, with just basic research. There's a great library here in New York City uh, at the New York Academy of Medicine. So it's a medical library. And I put on reserve 10 books by kind of common names in the history of medicine, Hippocrates, Galen, later figures as well. And the librarian, a wonderful librarian said to me, well, you must know about Girolamo Mercuriale. And I said, no, I don't actually. And she said, hold on a second. And she left, this was a rare books room. She came back a few minutes later wearing white gloves and holding a pristine first edition of Mercuriali's 1569 book called, as you said, Dell'arte Gymnastica, which means the art of gymnastics. And um, I took it out of the slipcase and opened it up and happened to open it up to an illustration. It's an illustrative book of two men wrestling. And I swear to God, Trey, like at that moment, like a light bulb went off. Like this guy's gonna be an important figure in my book. I don't know how, I'd never heard of him before, but here is a big, thick book now considered the first comprehensive book on exercise. And um, the only problem was, as I recognized right away, is that it was written in medieval Latin. So <laughs> while the illustrations were captivating, I couldn't read a word, except I did kind of recognize the Latin word for exercise, which is, I'll probably say it incorrectly, but exer exertatio. Hmm. Um, but I knew right away that I had to track down an English translation, which took a while. And then I did and was able to read the book and amazed Mercuriali was a physician, personal physician to a cardinal in Rome, um, a very wealthy, prosperous, prominent cardinal named Cardinal uh, Farnese. Farnese was a fairly young man, fairly healthy. So I think Mercuriali sort of had time on his hands to do what he wanted to do. And he had access to the Vatican Library and the Farnese Family Library. And he began looking into the ancient Greek and Roman texts on exercise and health, including Hippocrates, Galen, and some of these others who had written about exercise. He was able to uh, translate and decipher all of these different texts. And it was his idea to sort of revive the ancient Greek and Roman arts of exercise, which were extinct by that time in the mid 1500s. And um, the fascinating thing about the book is that there are chapters on virtually every form of exercise known at that time, walking, running, swimming, boxing, wrestling, etc. And he's writing it from the position of a physician. So sort of looking at the pros and cons and thinking about what he can prescribe for his patients. Um, a lot of his advice is actually quite sensible and reasonable. But there is one very important thing you need to know, and you'll find out in sweat. 
Um, Mercuriali, like everyone else, did not have an accurate understanding of how the human body works. Um, for many, many centuries, there was a belief in something called the four humors. They did not know about the circulation of blood by the beat of the heart. That did not come until the 18th century. So from antiquity up until like the 17th, 18th century, there was this belief in the four humors, um, some of which were completely fantastical. <laughs> Phlegm, black bile, mucus, other things. And the whole idea was to keep these fluids in balance. And so while Mercuriali's advice about exercise is reasonable in a lot of ways, it's all based on keeping these fantastical humors in balance. Um, it's not until much later that, that William Harvey and others discovered the circulation of the blood by the beat of the heart and how the body really works. So even going back to Hippocrates, Hippocrates believed in the four humors. So one has to look at their advice on exercise also through those eyes. They just, um, they just didn't have the understanding we have today. And some of that, frankly, had to do with the fact that dissection of human bodies was forbidden. So they didn't know how it worked inside and actually felt that it was the liver, not the heart, that circulated blood. Hmm. Um, so it's, it's very interesting. Um, and even in Mercuriali's book, there are parts or chapters of the book that are just um, fantastical or almost comical because he believed that any form of movement really was exercise. So even riding in the back of a canoe, let's say, hmm. even if you're not the one with, who's rowing, that that is a form of exercise that may balance your humors. Um, so yeah, there's a lot you could get away with. Or that he considered laughter or crying forms of exercise and how they might balance the humors. Now, he considered a lot of different things exercise, but if I'm remembering correctly, he didn't consider sports exercise. Is that right? And if so, why? Right. Um, sports had a whole different sort of um, prerequisites of rules, um, competition. Um, Mercuriali himself was very opposed to high intensity exercise or the kind of hypertrophy bodies that we see in bodybuilders today. Uh, Mercuriali actually really liked Hippocrates and Galen and the ancients. They felt that one should exercise moderately um, and get exercise every day. I think he was dead on with that one. What did Mercuriali think of running? Because if I'm perfectly honest, I'm somebody who loves to exercise. I can't stand running, though. I'm kind of with you. I'm, <laughs> I used to like to run, but it just doesn't... Um, feel good on my feet or my knees. He liked running because he felt anyone could do it. Um, and he even said men, women, and children could run. Um, Mercuriali was sort of breaking a taboo by saying that women could and should exercise. Um, but he did not talk about naked running. I think he said that, you know, one, one, one should wear, one should wear clothing, loose clothing. Um, but he endorsed running walking, swimming. Um, he was opposed to boxing for understandable reasons since he was a doctor. He felt it could do more harm than good, understandable. Um, I, on the other hand, decided to try my hand at serious boxing. And um, as you know, from reading the book, I went to a boxing boot camp, which mm -hmm. was very, you know, much more serious than I kind of expected. A six week boxing boot camp, six days a week, up at 6 a.m., learning how to box and um, learn some lessons I'll never forget. And that was the that was the result of a 40 year curiosity you had with fighting yeah. in general after seeing the Ali Frazier fight. Is that right? That's right. I grew up in a small town in Washington State, Spokane. Um, I was the only son. My dad was a West Point, had been a West Point cadet, military guy, very athletic, um, loved all sports, um, including boxing. Um, 
And I guess we did a little sparring in the garage, but he took me to a film of the Ali Frazier fight. And I was somehow captivated by that. And always really did want to learn how to box. There's a certain beauty in boxing as well. Um, almost a choreography to it. It is the sweet science after all. Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, I'm curious what it would feel like to hit someone. I mean, to really hit someone. Well, not but, just that, but it's also good for everybody to get their ass kicked once in their life. So did you get yeah, your ass kicked also? I certainly did. I mean, I didn't think too much about the fact that if I was going to really <laughs> <laughs> kick someone else's ass, I was going to get my ass kicked too. And uh, I lived to tell the tale. <laughs> I'm assuming that kicking ass was the uh, much more preferred version of that equation. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> so um, in, the, in the chapter of running, uh, you talk about the different ways that we sweat. There's the obvious thermal sweating, which is what the ancient Greeks were collecting off of their athletes and then selling to help hemorrhoids heal. Then there's also <laughs> emotional sweating. What yeah. is this and why did we evolve to do so, Bill? Yeah, there are two forms of sweating. Um, emotional sweating comes with intense emotions, whether um, fear or uh, anger or ecstasy even. And we see it in babies even right after they're born when they may start crying. You may see them sweat on their foreheads. Um, there are only certain parts of the body where there is what's called emotional sweating. The forehead, the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet. Um, and it's thought that it evolved to communicate a certain message so that way back, we're talking about Neanderthal, if you're um, unable to communicate with others, you can see the sweat on the forehead, which indicates danger or fear or injury, something like that. Um, but sometimes one, you sometimes you sweat in both ways at the same time. Sweating because you're running and maybe you're sweating because you're running out of fear. Um, and there are two different kinds of sweat in the human body. Um, one is purely thermoregulation, um, almost like instant air conditioning. Um, and the other is the emotional sweating, yeah. So uh, did Mercuriale write anything about the perils of people carrying excess weight? And if so, did he suggest any weight loss remedies? I was kind of surprised to learn that he did. Um, and I only know that because I did retrace Mercuriale's footsteps in this book. This book is a kind of combination of pure history going from antiquity to the present day, memoir where I sort of chronicle my own experiments and exercise from boxing to running, <laughs> running naked to swimming. I'm a, I love to swim. Um, I'm going to swim today, in fact. And um, just about every other form of exercise, including, including yoga. Um, but I wasn't sure from his book, Dell'Arte Gymnastica, how Mercuriale felt about people being overweight or using exercise to lose weight because he didn't address it in that book. Um, but through a series of lucky events, I discovered in an archive in Kansas City, Kansas, of all places, two um, translated transcripts of two of his other books. Mercuriali was someone who wrote at least 15 books in his lifetime, not just about exercise, but about lots of topics. Um, he wrote what's considered one of the first books on dermatology. He was a real physician, but he also wrote a kind of eccentric book about bodily appearance and bodily decoration. It's even about the art of cosmetics. And in that book, he comes out very strongly against obesity and people being overweight um, because it's unhealthy, but as he thought also unattractive. And for that, he did recommend intensive exercise to shed pounds and diet. He talked about diet as well. And in that book, he also talked in a way that he didn't in Dell'Arte Gymnastica about the fact that sweating or perspiration can have a really funky odor 
Hmm. And he had his own Renaissance era prescriptions or recipes for antiperspirants. Um, so that was fascinating to find as well. I mean, people may hear that and think it's no big deal, but they have to remember that this was a time where being heavy set was looked at as a quality that you wanted because it meant that you right. lived a more luxurious life. So he was sticking his neck out there uh, with that idea, even if he wasn't totally correct, as you point out in this book, about exercise being the key to losing weight. It is much more about caloric restriction, of course. He was, um, and you're right. It was, um, it was more a sign of nobility and of, of pro prosperity to be, to be heavy or of, in the case of women, sort of sensuality. Um, and it was the workers who were the ones who happened to be very thin from working in the fields or, you know, working. Um, so yeah, the book is very interesting in that way for what it recommends. Um, but I made many trips to Italy and to Rome where he wrote the book and to Forli where he was born, Padua where he later taught. And so part of the book is also retracing Mercuriali's footsteps and, and uh, learning about his life. Yeah, it's hard not to in interject yourself into a book that you're writing, especially where you may have personal experience doing what you're suggesting. You do a great job of weaving in your personal narrative with this search for an understanding of the history of exercise. As I told you uh, before the official start of this interview, it reads a little bit like a non-fictionalized version of the Da Vinci Code, where you're traveling all over the world to Italy, to Sweden, you end up in India at one point in pursuit of this knowledge. Yeah. And I think the end result is phenomenal, but you admire Mercuriale for never really infusing himself in his writings, including the Arte Gymnastica. So why do you believe he was a swimmer then? Uh, I believe he was a swimmer because of the way he describes swimming. And you're right, he does not inject his own exercise regime or workouts in the book at all. It's very much the uh, book of a physician. Um, but he describes swimming as something so pleasurable and the way the water feels on the body and the way it almost tickles the body, I think he says, that made me feel like he's definitely got experience as a swimmer. Um, there's something, I'm a swimmer, there's something very pleasurable about swimming, not being on land, you know, especially nowadays, you know, not having, not having a cell phone in your ear, not having access to the internet, just being in this kind of silent world, except for the, the noise of just the water itself. Um, that's very meditative. And it just feels good. Um, as long as it's not too cold, you know, my book actually opens the opening passage in my book is called plunge. And it has me plunging into a 50 degree lake in upstate New York. Um, it was October, it was fall, beautiful day, but um, I was at an artist residency that was set on a lake. And uh, I just decided I would take a plunge. And uh, actually it felt fantastic. Um, anyone who does that kind of polar, polar bear swimming or cold water, ice water swimming knows this. Um, I couldn't go very far for very long, but it, um, it felt amazing. And once I got out of the water, just my whole body tingling. I can understand why people get addicted to that, but that's not really my thing. I, I swim more in a, gosh, what is it? 75 degree pool or something like that. There is a certain exhilaration. It doesn't just last in the few moments after you get out of the water. It really does stay with you for the rest of the day. Yeah, yeah, it really does. It's amazing. I mean, if I had access to that, I'm sure I would do it more. So not only did Mercuriale believe that sitting in the back of a canoe being rowed by somebody else was exercise, he also considered things like laughing, crying, and holding yeah. one's breath were exercise. What was his argument yeah. for laughter being exercise? Because I got to admit, in thinking about it, I kind of agree with him. It kind of makes sense. I mean, if you laugh really hard, your abdominal muscles are really getting a workout. Um, especially if you laugh for a long time. Um, it goes back to his belief in the four humors and in any form of movement of the human body uh, having an effect on the humors. Um, 
So he did look at laughter, crying, uh, any form of movement. Um, and I tried to do that myself. I was sort of trying to be my own 21st century version of Mercuriali, even though I'm not a doctor, but um, testing out these various forms of exercise, looking into their history, and also trying, again, I'm not an anatomist or a kinesiologist, but trying to sort of dissect the dynamics of human movement. Um, one of my first books was a book on human anatomy called The Anatomist, in which I tell the story behind the classic 19th century book, Gray's Anatomy, and tell the story of Henry Gray. And for that book, sort of like sweat, um, I inject my own personal experience. And in the beginning, it was purely for research, but I spent a year studying anatomy with first year med students at a medical school in San Francisco. And um, at first I was just an observer, came to every lecture, went to the dissection lab with the med students, and eventually they allowed me to join them. And so I came to the point of doing full cadaver dissection and sort of doing what Henry Gray had done back in the 1850s. And it just gave me such a deeper, richer understanding of what he had done, but also what med students have to learn to become doctors. And it gave me this grounding in an understanding of the human body that I think came in handy in writing sweat which is also very much about the dynamics of human movement. I would have to imagine that much like with those who go out to small farms to watch the butcher process play out, to truly appreciate the food, that going through dissecting cadavers would give you a newfound appreciation for the human body too. It, it really, really does. Um, and I not only was studying along med students, but also pharmacy students and physical therapy students. So it's sort of seeing the human body from all different perspectives. Um, and the perspective of the physical therapy students, which was actually the toughest of all three of those courses, um, was especially interesting because you're really looking at the neuromuscular system. And yeah, it's just fascinating. Really, really fascinating. Fascinating. The Arte Gymnastica includes illustrations by Piero Ligorio. Your efforts to locate and see these illustrations are quite the story on their own. But as far as the drawings themselves, Bill, why were they so important for this book? Well, it's funny, you know, the first edition of Mercuriali's book was in 1569. So that's the first edition, which wasn't the edition that I first saw. And it contained no illustrations at all. It was just his text. It did well enough at the time that the publisher suggested a revised version and suggested adding illustrations. You have to remember that the book itself, the printed book was still a fairly new phenomenon. And publishers found that books with pictures or illustrations sold well and added to the experience of reading. So Mercuriali commissioned his friend, former colleague, Piero Ligorio, to do drawings for his book. And um, they had had a long history together, had known one another in Rome, but they were both in Rome at the same time. And uh, by the time Mercuriali was working on the 1573 edition, he had moved on from Rome to Padua and Ligorio, his old friend, was not far away in another town in Italy. And he contacted him and commissioned him. Piero Ligorio was someone who had been truly a Renaissance man, not only an artist, but a very uh, established architect, antiquarian, historian, really a Renaissance man. And, um, but he had fallen on hard times. He had a big family to support so he could use the work. And he did these really quite amazing drawings. They're engravings in the book that I think had a lot to do with the book's continued success. I think in Mercuriali's lifetime, Dell'Arte Gymnastica was, went into five or six editions, but it continued to go into editions up into the 17th century. 
And I think just as with Grey's Anatomy, which is still published today, it's never gone out of print, still bought by med students and art students. And one of the main reasons is because of the amazing illustrations in that book, illustrations of the human body. And, um, and I think part of the success of Dell'Arte Gymnastica is owed to Ligorio and his, his engravings. Um, and again, sort of breaking a taboo, one of the illustrations shows women exercising. And um, one of the challenges for me and frustrations as I did research on the book was finding the role of women in exercise, in the history of exercise. Because for so many centuries, women were just not encouraged or even permitted to exercise. So um, I was always happy to find little pockets of history where they were. Well, and that includes one of the biggest shocking, uh, one of the most shocking things that I read in this book, Harriet Beecher Stowe's sister mm -hmm. making a contribution here. Yeah, Catherine Beecher in the 19th century. Um, I think I call her the Jane Fonda of her day. <laughs> she, was, um, she was groundbreaking. Um, things started to shift in the 19th century for a number of reasons the Industrial Revolution having a lot to do with it when there was a widespread fear and belief that life had become too sedentary as people moved from the farm, I'm speaking generally, from the farm to the factory and weren't physically exercising or moving as much. So there was a new encouragement for people to get exercise. And this intersected with the burgeoning women's rights movement. So there was a new interest in encouraging women and children, by the way, to get exercise. And Catherine Beecher took this up and wrote something like a dozen books dealing not only with exercise, but dealing with exercise from a woman's perspective, a mother's perspective. She lectured widely, went around the country, leading classes, teaching classes. Um, and when I say she was like the Jane Fonda of her day, that's partly because she did publish books and was well known as an exercise expert, but she also encouraged women to exercise in the home, to um, exercise while doing housework or while cleaning the house or while taking care of the kids and even putting on music or using music at the same time. So um, yeah, Catherine Beecher was um, very important in the history of exercise. Um, and yeah, as I said, sort of an early Jane Fonda. Yeah, I love the promotion of physical movement as a form of exercise, even if it's not traditional strength training necessarily, just getting out there and moving. Back to yeah. your point of uh, just merely walking from point A to point B can be so valuable in the long term for your health. Absolutely, I try to encourage people to think of exercise as synonymous with movement. So for those who maybe feel they don't have time or they don't belong to a gym or want to belong to a gym or have the funds to belong to a gym, I'll say like, maybe on your way home from work, uh, stop two bus stops early or two subway stops early and walk the rest of the way home. You know, a half a mile, that's a great walk. And that's, you can tell yourself, you can feel good about it. I exercise today. Don't think of it as, oh, shit, I have to, you know, walk home. But it's getting some exercise into your day. When I lived in Chicago, I used to play a game called Beat the Bus, where the bus system was so slow there at times that it was look down the road. If you don't see a sign of the bus, walk to that next bus stop a block or two away. And yeah. uh, it was surprising how many blocks I was able to go at times. But it was also just <laughs> one of those things where it's like, you're moving and you're not really thinking about it. It's this fun little game that you've created for yourself. Yeah, and I've made that a part of my life in New York. You know, I moved here 12 years ago from San Francisco. And just as I've gotten older, maybe a little less interested in bulking up at the gym or that sort of thing. And uh, if I have a meeting in Midtown, sometimes I think I'm just gonna walk home. It'll only take 45 minutes and that'll be my exercise for the day. And it gives you a different perspective on your city. And um, 
if you have some good music on that always helps yes it does <laughs> and now, you don't have to you don't have to run <laughs> no you don't you can you can go at a leisurely pace or you could go as a, at a uh, an olympic speedwalker pace too it's kind of fun to do that on the That's island right. as well now mercuriale included a chapter in de arte gymnastica that was titled via translation as quote a refutation of those who think everyone should exercise what was right. his argument here uh, that was a little eccentric. Uh, <laughs> I mean, some of it was reasonable. He felt that, you know, the elderly and the sick or the disabled shouldn't and didn't need to exercise. Um, but again, it goes back to the four humors and feeling that those who he sort of diagnosed as being completely out of balance, maybe exercise would not be a good idea. Um, but uh, I think he was also opposed to people overdoing it. And this goes back to the ancients. You know, it was Plato who had a great quote. I can never remember it, so I had to write it down. Um, Plato said, it is not the number of exercises, but their moderate nature that brings about a good human constitution. And that was really the philosophy of the ancients. And this is really apart from talking about Olympic athletes and that sort of thing. Um, but that is reasonable advice today, even during the pandemic, you know, when we've all had to adapt to perhaps not going to gyms or just changing our exercise routines, um, just keep moving. Yeah, we all reached that point, Bill, where going for your one rep max or a personal record on a lift just becomes reckless. Like, what's the point? Who are you trying to brag to? Your friends? Well, right. your friends might want to understand for themselves that if you keep trying to do that, it's eventually going to end badly for you. Yeah, um, and he understood that people could overdo it and be injured. And I've certainly done that myself. I've had uh, all kinds of exercise-related injuries. Um, I'm now 61, but uh, from weightlifting, um, torn rotator cuff, um, herniated discs in my neck from uh, deadlifts, uh, what's called swimmer shoulder from swimming, not with great technique, uh, bad knees from running. Fortunately, I've never had to have surgery or anything like that, but yeah, you can, um, there are a lot of exercise related injuries you can avoid, even with something like yoga, which some, a lot of people think of as being very gentle, uh, intense yoga classes, especially in the US, uh, people can overdo it if they don't know the correct technique. No doubt about that. When did yoga come to be? And at what point did it break from a certain mysticism and become mm -hmm. much more about the physical body as a way to reach enlightenment? Yes. Many, I mean, thousands of years ago, so equivalent to the times of uh, Hippocrates and the founding of the Olympic Games, but we're talking in the Eastern world, in India, um, not in the West. And I should say that most of my book does deal with the West, um, but I've practiced yoga for years and um, I made a trip to India in part just to look into the origins of yoga. I was kind of surprised. It's, it's around the 19th century that yogis or yoga masters started to migrate or travel to the West, mm. Europe and the US and travel widely and lecture about the benefits of yoga and um, sort of convert people to the benefits of yoga. And um, it became quite, quite popular. So that's really where the yoga that we practice today here began. How did yoga in Mumbai, India differ from what's going on in a studio in New York City? Well, in my experience, it was completely different. I was used to going to a vinyasa yoga class here that was, another name for it was power yoga. That's how they, well, that's what they called it. And it was the kind of yoga where there'd be 75 people in the class it would be quite intense, you'd really sweat, and it was really strenuous, a great workout, um, really a great workout, but intense and nonstop, you, you know, for an hour um, with a cool down, but it was pretty much nonstop. And I would just be drenched. Um, but in um, 
Mumbai and Kerala and India, where I went to yoga classes, was just <laughs> much more chill, much more low key. Um, it had a kind of beauty to it. It was really more about just appreciating, understanding the body, focusing on breathing, focusing on stretching. Um, the teachers that I had were um, almost more, I would say, informational than instructional. So it was um, not as intensive and competitive as it can be in the US. I mean, things are different right now because of the pandemic, but pre-pandemic, some of those yoga classes, at least that I went to, it was, it was competitive. And, um, you know, you'd be watching the person next to you or on the other side of you and either feeling like you're really good or like you're really bad. Um, and you know what, that can happen in the swimming pool too. If you get in a lane with someone who's a great swimmer, um, it can be sort of intimidating. Who was Pear Henrik Ling and why is he such an important figure in the history of exercise? This is an, a very important figure um, in the history of exercise from the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, in Stockholm, Sweden, he founded the world's, the history's first college um, or institution for exercise science, as we would call it today. And he developed his own unique method of exercise, which really is the foundation or origin of group fitness classes, like aerobics classes or group fitness classes today. Um, so his whole concept was large groups of people and very significantly, both men and women, they were separated. So there are classes for men and classes for women. Um, really what I would call calisthenics, um, very tightly choreographed. And there was a kind of drill master, whether it was Per Henrik Ling or one of his students leading it and um, leading people in kind of nonstop choreographed calisthenic movements. One of the important things about Ling is that it was also an institute for educating teachers. And he wanted to sort of spread the gospel of Ling, the Ling system as it was called um, around the world. And he did do that. So in England, the first physical education or PE teachers were from Ling's Institute in Stockholm and, um, and then into the US and Ling's students slash teachers were those who influenced people like Catherine Beecher. So Catherine Beecher sort of absorbed Per Henrik Ling's teachings and his philosophy uh, into her own and she sort of created her own. But um, I would say he was important for promoting this idea of group fitness, but also exercise for women and exercise for children. And um, so, yeah, you know, this book took me all over the world um, from New York to San Francisco to Italy, a lot, a lot of Italy, London, Paris, India, Kansas City. <laughs> Did I say Sweden? Yeah, Sweden. Um, and it was kind of, I was kind of, it was a very spontaneous journey. I was just kind of following my gut. And if I discovered something, I would pick up and go. And I should give ample credit to the Guggenheim Foundation. I was lucky enough to get a Guggenheim Foundation fellowship to do research for this book. And that's what allowed me to really travel for about a year, two years and do research for this book. Well, I feel like their investment paid off. Why are the 1970s so crucial for modern exercise? Yeah, you know, it's funny. A lot of people really do think like that's when exercise started. Um, and I understand that. I would say the 1970s is really when exercise transformed into the fitness industry mm. and for a number of reasons became globally popular. And some of that definitely had to do with celebrity um, and, um, and economics, understanding that opening gyms and having members that there was an interest in that. 
the 70s was also a time of a new kind of sexual liberation and interest in improving appearance and um, that kind of pre-AIDS era where people were really into fitness and, and working out. And of course it coincided with the women's liberation movement. So there were a lot of, there was a confluence of events that came together uh, that made the 1970s definitely a turning point. And it's from there that people like Jane Fonda and Arnold Schwarzenegger who were leading figures for women and men alike um, emerged. Yeah, and Jane actually says some very nice things about this book that are on the uh, back book cover. How did that happen? I mean, I'm shaking my head as you say that because I, you know, I'm a few days away from this book actually being published and I still can't believe it. I really can't. I did research on uh, the 70s and 80s and Jane Fonda, Arnold Schwarzenegger and a few other people who I knew. I'm a child of the 70s. Um, and I certainly remember Jane Fonda and going to aerobics classes that were modeled on hers. Um, but I wanted to take a really serious look at it, you know, and, and at her work. And I think I approached it a little bit skeptically, um, thinking it was a very 80s thing, you know, with leg warmers and all of that. But I was so, I was really so impressed. Um, the original workout video, I, I can tell you, it is not dated a bit, except for maybe the clothing, like the leg warmers and pink leotards. But um, it's a very good workout. It's very reasonable. It's um, intensive, but moderate. It begins with a warm up, ends with a cool down. She incorporates a little bit of yoga into it. Um, in the video itself, it's very diverse in terms of men and women, black, white, Latino. Um, and then of course she went on to make many videos and wrote a number of books. So purely, and then most importantly, I was just impressed at what a great teacher she was. Hmm. You know, I've had really good yoga or group fitness teachers, and I've had some that just aren't that good or aren't as gifted. It's not easy. It is not easy to lead a group fitness class. I would be terrified. But um, she was so articulate about teaching you what to do. Um, and then I think really cleverly in the videos came in with voiceovers to add even more detail. So explaining what muscles, what parts of the body are being worked and cautioning people to be careful, don't go too far, if, you know, this is too much. I was really impressed. And so I do write about Jane Fonda and about Schwarzenegger, but I never imagined that she would read the book and then offer to blurb it. But um, through my editor at Bloomsbury, they managed to get the manuscript to her. And I just thought, there's no way. <laughs> but within, I think within two weeks or less, this great blurb came back where she said she was riveted, riveted by the ups and downs in the history of exercise. And then she ends with the, the question or the quote, who knew? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, if Jane Fonda didn't know this history, then um, maybe I'm really onto something. So it was really, really generous of her. I'm just, uh, I feel like it was blessed by the queen of, of exercise. That's incredible. And congratulations on that. And by the way, the proof is in the pudding too. I mean, she moves so well for her age. She moves better than people half of her age at yeah. her current state of affairs. Yeah, she looks amazing. Um, yeah. Yeah, incredible. And really, I mean this sincerely, looking at the history of exercise, she's definitely one of the most important figures um, and certainly the most important or one of the most important women um, in bringing exercise to people around the world and making accessible, especially to women in their homes, you know, if they don't belong to a gym or uh, don't want to go to a gym or if they have kids at home and making it easy and making it fun. And the videos had music and she just made it all seem fun, you know, but, um, and gave people great workouts. 
One more question on De Arte Gymnastica, because this is an incredible book, considering the time that it was written, all the ideas that it talks about, and it wasn't right about everything, but there are exercise books in 2022 that get some stuff wrong. Exactly. Why did this, why did this book not make more of a lasting impression on popular culture, Bill? That's a really good question. Um, I think it's just a, a cultural, complete cultural difference. I think he was a man ahead of his time um, in really writing it from a physician's perspective, um, that the culture just wasn't you know, ready to accept that. As, as you pointed out, it was almost more uh, impressive or popular to be paunchy if you're a man or a woman. Um, but yeah, it didn't. He his hope of revitalizing the ancient Greek arts of exercise, unfortunately, didn't come true, and Mercuriali himself didn't become the Hippocrates of the Renaissance. He's someone who sort of faded into history, and throughout my work in my earlier books, I've always been kind of interested in these figures who definitely made an impact, but for one reason or another kind of got lost to history. And I really would not have even known about Mercuriali to the extent that I do if it weren't for a librarian, uh, not Google, <laughs> not the internet, but a very wise librarian who introduced me to Mercuriali and led me on this incredible, or started me on this incredible journey that ended up in this book of mine, Sweat. Well, it's such a great testament to the power of true human connection versus yeah. everything becoming so digitized, right? Yeah, it, absolutely. In fact, I've been in touch with her. And of course, the library, the rare books room had to be closed during the pandemic. And mm -hmm. um, it's a really beautiful small room with all these ancient books. But uh, they've recently been allowed to reopen and bring in uh, readers, as, as we're called, wearing masks and everything. But mm. um, I'm really glad the Rare Books Room is back open because libraries and librarians like her are so important. Yeah, that's great to hear. So I wanted to end today's conversation on a bit of a personal note because you write about your partner, the mm -hmm. renowned neurologist Oliver Sacks, who for, for me, I'm somebody who's a bit of an armchair neurologist, and it has a lot to do with Oliver Sacks and books that I was reading as a teenager oh, wow. and somebody in my early 20s. Uh, and just the, the fascinating and layman's way that he was able to understand so many uh, complex ideas about the brain. He loved yeah. exercise. It's actually something that y'all bonded over. And he yeah. was even doing it on his deathbed in 2015 in a way that seems so wonderfully befitting of him. How so? Yeah. yeah, so amazing. And really, I'm a swimmer today because of Oliver. He was a great swimmer, long distance swimmer. Um, and when we first fell in love, you know, he was swimming three times a week. And uh, eventually I began to join him at the pool. But he did. And he also worked out at the gym, lifting weights. He had a trainer and exercised until the end of his life. I mean, he swam uh, a couple times a week and I with him up until maybe a month before his death in August, 2015, just made him feel so good. He loved it. He always, he was kind of a big man, a little bit awkward on land, but when he was in the pool, he was a really elegant and, and powerful swimmer. But even when he was virtually on his deathbed, he would make a point of just vigorously moving his limbs, even using stretchy cords and very light dumbbells just to keep the blood moving and because it felt good. And that's what I tell people about exercise. You know, exercise not because you think it's going to make you live a long life or maybe even because you think it's going to make you lose a lot of weight. Find a form of exercise that makes you feel good in the moment, in your body, about your body, about yourself, and then you will keep exercising. It is wonderful advice. And last question, understandably, his death doused your passion for exercise and for writing this book. What <clears throat> reignited both of those things? It's true. I, I had written and researched quite a bit of this book before he got sick. And then I put it aside in part just to be with him, take care of him and just be with him. We traveled in his last year. It was an incredible year, incredibly productive for him. 
And then after his death, I just really did lose my passion. And it was a really hard time. But it is one upside of the pandemic. I, I live in what was Oliver's apartment. I had a lot of time to myself. And I thought, I think Oliver would want me to finish that book. And uh, brought out the manuscript. I had not looked at it really, honestly, in, in three, at least three years, maybe four years. And um, in a lot of ways, I think the time away from it benefited the book. I was able to approach it with a more, with some distance and see right away what works, what didn't work, how I wanted to shape the narrative, how I wanted to interweave these various stories, the history of exercise, my own history of exercise, the Mercuriali story, and weave it together. And so I was able to finish the book in about a year. Well, the end result is beautiful. He is Bill Hayes, the award-winning author of Insomniac City and How New York Breaks Your Heart. His newest book is titled Sweat, A History of Exercise. You can get it now wherever books are sold. Bill, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this important book. Oh, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. Join me next time when I speak with addiction psychiatrist, bioethics scholar, and author Carl Eric Fisher on The Urge, Our History of Addiction. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for hanging out. You can watch, listen, learn, and connect for free at BooksOnPod.com. For Books on Pod, I'm Trey Elling. Good day.